Praise God. What a joy to call in the name of the Lord this morning together. It's such a beautiful thing to, uh, to lift up his name with the people of God. I'm so thankful that I get to uh, walk with Christ with you here in Rapid City in the Black Hills. God's doing a good work in our midst. Well, this, uh, this is our last Sunday in Genesis 12, but uh, before we go from the Word of God, I just want to thank Daniel and Paola for being here from Costa Rica. Can we just welcome them here uh, for being here? Thank you, guys. Sentimos tan agradecidos por ustedes. Son un gran bendición para nosotros. Daniel and uh, Paola are here for uh, a few days, and... Um, you, many of you know uh, we have a partnership in Costa Rica. Uh, Daniel's father, Juan, was the leader of Increse uh, for, for many years, and a few years ago he, he passed away, and so uh, it, was, it was really special for me personally to hear from Daniel just how God met them in that journey of, uh, of, of losing someone so significant in their lives and how God has met them. Um, we just sang, our lives will not be shaken, right? A firm foundation, and I see that in their lives. And Paola worked closely with Eduardo uh, for, for many years, and uh, as we know, Eduardo passed away a few months ago. So um, been through a lot, um, but we're so grateful uh, for you guys. Uh, as Michael said, on Monday, we're going to have a memorial service for, for Eduardo. So if you see them after the service, please greet them, welcome them here to our midst. If you would turn in your Bibles uh, to Genesis chapter 12, this is our final message in, in Genesis. And, uh, you know, part of me is a little sad because I kind of want to continue through Genesis. <laughs> it's like, it's so rich. Uh, I, have a, I have a sense that at some point we're going to jump back into Genesis and we're going to finish this book. Um, but we really uh, feel strongly from the Lord that um, he's calling us to walk through the book of Deuteronomy. Now, if you've been through around church for any length of time, you know that many churches preach to Deuteronomy. <laughs> it's not a common book. And I, I think in some ways that's a travesty because um, I think it's very hard to understand the New Testament, and particularly the Gospels, and understand the ministry of Jesus and his call to make disciples without understanding Deut Deuteronomy. Now, so I think it's foundational for us as Christians. Um, but you know what, even as Americans, uh, Deuteronomy is a significant book for the history of America. I don't know if you realize, but the founders of this nation quoted more from Deuteronomy than any other book. Any other book of the Bible, any other book, period. Deuteronomy was the book they went back to over and over and over again. Now, there's a reason for that, I think. And I, so I think as Christians, we need to understand God's call for discipleship. But I think even as Americans, I think we need to remember some of our foundations, where we came from. And that we're going to learn in Deuteronomy, it's all about remembering. we got to remember. Why? Because we're so forgetful. <laughs> we forget, and we need that reminder in our lives. And so I believe this is a, a, a time from the Lord that we as a church uh, really focus in on this important book. But um, as a preaching team, we felt like we couldn't really understand Deuteronomy without understanding the first 12 chapters of Genesis. Uh, it's foundational. It's a story of God. It's the story of what God is doing in the world. Uh, it's also foundational to understand the Exodus story. Now, we're, I wish we had time to go to Exodus first, but, but we're going to be referring a lot to the Exodus story. But, but these first 12 chapters, in particular, chapter 12, gives us the foundational story of God's work in the world. In our time, in our day, Chapter 12 is very relevant uh, to the things that are happening in the world today. And so, um, would you turn? And I'm going to, I know we haven't been doing this every Sunday, but I'm going to ask if you would stand in honor of God's word with me as we read these first nine verses of chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth, did you see that? All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him as well. And Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. 
He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out from the land, for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. And Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. And that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he went on towards the hills of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel in the west and Ai in the east. And he built an altar to the Lord and he called on the name of the Lord. And Abram set out and continued towards the Negev. You may be seated. So I'm going to give you my outline uh, up front. There's three big ideas here. One is the grace of God, two is the promise of God, and three is the faith of Abram. The grace of God, the promise of God, and the faith of Abram. Now, it's interesting, chapter 11, uh, we learn about the Tower of Babel, but we also learn about this family of uh, descendants from Shem, and we find the lineage of Abram. And in the end of chapter 11, we learn that Terah, the father of Abram, is already setting out towards Canaan. Isn't that interesting? Their family was headed towards this land, but they stop in Haran and they pause. <laughs> and they live there and they settle there. And so we have this family on a journey towards this land. And we don't know the backstory of why they were headed to that place. But they were headed there. And Abram is in this land of Haran when he receives this call or this um, commission or this voice of God in his life. Now, I just want you to understand the magnitude of this moment. Um, whether you realize it or not, over 50% of the globe today, present today, have, their lives have been shaped by this moment where God spoke to Abram. Um, that's a lot of people. <laughs> that's billions of people including us, <laughs> we're part of that. This world has not been the same since this moment. So th this, is a, this, is a, this is an important moment in the history of humanity. And you know what? There's still wars and battles and all kinds of things happening in our world today because of this moment. And so this is a powerful moment and it has a great influence on our world and it has great influence in our lives. And so I think it's really important we understand what's, what's happening what is God revealing to us in this moment? And so what we begin to see, I think, is the first thing, what we see in verses 1 through 3, we see the grace of God. We're discovering through God's revelation who God is. Remember we said at the beginning of the series, this is a story not about us. It's a story about God. <laughs> this is God's story. And in His grace, He's revealed it to us. And He's included us. And He's told us who we are in this story, that we are image bearers. We are made in his likeness. And we're told in Genesis 1 and 2 and throughout the story that we have incredible value because we are made in the image of God and we are commissioned by God to uh, fill the earth, right? To fill the earth and multiply and be fruitful, right? And we're told we have incredible freedom as image bearers of God. But we are also told we are dependent on God that we are meant to be in relationship with God. We are meant to walk with God. And that there is no life apart from God. And we're also told in this story that humanity continually rebels. And we've seen that rebellion over and over, whether it was Adam and Eve, whether it was Cain, whether it was uh, the descendants of, of Cain, and, or if it was even Ham, right? One of the sons of Noah and his descendants. We see in the Tower of Babel this story of rebellion. But look at verse 1 through 3. The Lord had said to Abraham, did you catch that? The Lord said? <laughs> Does that remind you of chapter 1 where God said? He said, let there be light. Now this is revealing something powerful about God. God is a speaking God. He's a God of word. He is a God who created all things through word and sustains all things through word. He communicates. And that means he could be known and he is making himself known. He is revealing himself in this moment. Now, the Jews have a strong tradition that Abram and his family were idol worshipers. 
They were not necessarily worshiping God at this time. In fact, uh, there's a lot of tradition that they had become idol worshipers. In fact, since the time of Noah, people had begun to, we see, rebel. Remember the Tower of Babel. And so what catches my attention here is Abram had done nothing of merit to attract God to him. (laughs) In fact, all at this time, we have lists of names, endless names, all these people, and Abram's just one of them. Yet God chooses. God steps into human history. He steps into Abram's life, and what does he do? He speaks. He speaks. That's significant. And so what we're seeing is that the favor of God, the blessing of God, the goodness of God is not dependent on anything Abram has done or anything anyone has done, because all we've seen throughout the story is rebellion and failure. We've seen glimpses of people who respond to God, but God always acts first. God spoke first to Adam and Eve. He spoke first to Cain and Abel. He spoke first to Noah, and now he speaks first to Abram. Do you see the pattern? God always moves first. He's a God of grace. And the Paul, the apostle, says in Ephesians 1, as he, I'm sure, is reflecting on part of this story, but the whole story of God, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And isn't it interesting that when God speaks, what is the first thing he speaks to Abram? Blessing. (laughs) What does that tell us about God? That when God speaks, he blesses. He gives Verse 4, for he chose us in him, in Christ, before the creation of the world. Wait, Paul is thinking about this. He's thinking about the grace of God. He's thinking about God moves in our lives. He moves in our world before we've done anything. In fact, Paul even takes a step further. Even before we were born, even before the earth was created, God was already speaking blessing into the lives of his people. Isn't that amazing? Does that just blow you? It blows me away. It's astounding. And he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure, his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Here here we're seeing the definition of grace. It's not earned. It's not deserved. Abraham didn't earn this. He didn't deserve this. God spoke because of his grace. Freely given. In him we have redemption through his blood. This is talking about Jesus, the forgiveness of sins in accordance to the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment. Do you believe God's in charge of time? I do. (laughs) Because the word of God says... God is working through history, he's working through time to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. You see, God is revealing his character to us in this story. He's telling us that he's a God of grace. Boy, if you don't take anything away from this morning, take this away that your creator, your maker, the one that sustains all things, his heart is a heart of grace. His heart is a heart of blessing. That is good news, brothers and sisters. That is good news. I am so thankful that when God speaks, he speaks grace. And that's what Abraham heard. He heard the grace of God. But here's the second thing that Abraham heard. He heard that God is a God of promise. God is a God of promise. So when he speaks, there's grace, but there's also a promise. There's a promise. Now look at the promise that he gave to Abraham. Verse 2. I will make you into a great nation. Now, I want you to catch this. This is really important. This is in the context of what? Last week, we looked at the Tower of Babel. What were people doing? They were using the gifts of God, what God had graciously given them. Just like we have so many good gifts from God, so much that God has poured into our lives. There's so much blessing in our lives. It's a gift. But what did the people of the Tower of Babel, they took the gift And what did they say? They said, we're going to make a name for ourselves. We're going to make a name for ourselves. Now, look at the contrast. People apart from God saying, no, we're going to make ourselves great. But look at what God says to Abraham, who wasn't great, 
who wasn't making a name for himself. He was just a, a nomad wandering in this land that wasn't his own towards this, some future that he didn't understand. And so he was, in a sense, this picture of lostness, wandering. And yet God speaks grace. And then what does God say? I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And then look at, verse, uh, look at the rest of verse 2. I will make your name great. We're learning something here about the promise of God. Now, I, I get it. <laughs> There's something intrinsic in us that wants greatness. And I think that's from God. I think that ambition, that desire, that drive that's in us, that's being made in the image of God. That's a good thing. But remember the lie of Satan in the garden to Adam and Eve? If you take the fruit, then you will be like God. Remember the lie? And that is the lie that somehow we can take the gifts of God and that we can make ourselves great. But what does God tell Abraham? No, that's not what I intended. I will make you great. I will bless you. I will make you into a great nation. I will make your name great. You see the order? You see the difference? God's revealing something to us crucial, important. He says, you will be a blessing. In verse 3, I will bless those who bless you. Do you see who's doing the blessing? He says, and whoever curses, I will curse. God is doing the blessing. God is doing the curses. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. I was reflecting last week on the Tower of Babel, and I came across a quote that I want to share with you this morning. C.S. Lewis, many of you guys know one of the most quoted authors that you know he shows up a lot in christian circles but he has a he has an incredible story of atheism saying i don't i don't really believe in god but he came across a painting a beautiful he came across beauty and he couldn't explain beauty and and all these people were praising the artist and then he it clicked in his heart and his mind he said we were made to praise we were made for transcendence, and, and he came to faith in Jesus Christ. But he says, an author should never conceive himself or herself as bringing into existence beauty or wisdom. So, so C.S. Lewis understands the order here, which did not exist before, but simply and solely as trying to embody in terms of his own art some reflection of eternal beauty and wisdom. You see, C.S. Lewis understands something profound at this moment. That if there is anything good, if there's anything beautiful, if there's anything as human beings we can do, we must understand that it comes from God. And anything that we produce comes from God. And that's what we're seeing here in this moment. God is revealing to Abram that not only is he gracious, but he has a promise that he will bless. He will fulfill those longings and those desires that are in us, those longings for greatness, those longings to matter, for meaning, for purpose, to create beauty, to have wisdom, to have good things in this earth. He's reminding Abram that, that he is the God who will produce those things. He will give those things. He's not holding back on us. He's not going to hold back on us. He wants to give it. As Paul said in Ephesians, it's lavish. It's generous. And creation speaks of that. Everywhere you look, it's super abundance, whether it's up in the stars or the flowers or the trees this fall. What we see is super abundance. We see the grace of God and the promise of God. It's the word of God that God says, I will do this. And what we're going to see throughout Genesis is God keeps his promise throughout the story of Abraham, through the story of Isaac, through the story of Jacob. Because remember, Abram and Sarai don't have any children at this moment when God says this, right? They don't have any children. In fact, God's going to come through with this promise, and we're going to see that over and over again. But it doesn't stop with Genesis. It goes all the way through the Bible that God is a promise keeping God. So, so what does this mean for us today? Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, beginning of the New Testament, the genealogy of Jesus. Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abram. Now, I want you to pay attention here to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, because we can say, okay, what, what does this mean for us today? Well, this is what Paul says. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham 
So now Paul's going all the way to Genesis 12. He's linking it here. He's saying, saying Jesus came for a purpose. He came for a reason. And this is the reason that the blessing that given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith we might receive what? The promise of the Spirit. The promise. Do you hear that? The promise of the Spirit. In verse 16 of chapter 3 of Galatians, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Now, this is important. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Now, we have to go back to Genesis 3.15. What did God tell Adam and Eve? He said, there's this terrible curse and death and pain and toil and all this stuff is happening to you and to this world. But I give you a promise that through the seed, singular, through the seed of a woman, I will crush the head of the serpent. We see a messianic promise at the very beginning. And here we see the faithfulness of God to keep his promise, meaning God is going to bring this blessing to the people that he created. Look at verse 26 of chapter 3 of Galatians. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. So what, what, is, what is Paul saying? He's saying the blessing given to Abraham is meant for all people. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew or Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ... Listen to this. You too are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Brothers and sisters, this is, this is awesome. This is amazing. God is doing something. It's a redemptive plan to reverse the curse of death and destruction in our world. But he's doing it in the most surprising, amazing way. He brings a seed of Abraham. And we know as Christians that Jesus Christ claimed that he he said, before Abraham was, I am. Remember John chapter 8? Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, to be the one promised in Genesis chapter 3, to be the one who promised the blessing and the fulfillment of the blessing. And now Paul is saying, this is what Jesus is doing. He's not keeping the blessing to himself. What is he doing? He's sharing it with everyone. And so no matter what your class is, what you're, uh, whether you're male or female, whether you're slave or free, he's saying, it's available. It's available. The blessing. God's not holding it back. He wants to give the blessing. His heart is to give the blessing. We can receive the blessing in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but the question about Israel, uh, you know, has God abandoned his promise to Israel? Romans 9 through 11, no. Paul's very clear, God still has a special place for the people of Israel, but in Jesus Christ, we have been grafted in, and we are part of God's redemptive plan in the world. Third, the faith of Abraham. And so we see the grace of God, we see the promise of God, but God doesn't force himself on us or anyone. He invites, he offers, but we must choose I love this story because it, it shows us that beautiful tension of the sovereignty of God, that God has a redemptive plan that nothing will stop, yet God gives us an opportunity to respond, either in faith or in rebellion. And we see that throughout Genesis, and we see that in here with Abram. Abram wasn't forced to receive this. He had a choice. And what does he do? He chooses to trust and obey God. Verse 4, so Abraham went, or Abram went, and did as the Lord told him. He went, he did what God told him. He trusts and he believed. Look at the promise in verse 7. God said, I'm going to give you this land. And what does, God, what does Abram do? He builds an altar. He worships God. Look at verse 7 and 8. He builds an altar, and then he goes on through the, out the land, and he builds an altar, and he calls on the name of the Lord. So what we're seeing in Abraham is what God is calling each of us. When we see the grace of God, when we hear the promise of God, we have a choice. Will we respond to God in faith and trust and obedience, or will we turn the other way? That's the choice. 
And Jesus said, we still have that choice. Jesus said, I come that you may have life, but not everyone believes. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 10. But what does it say? The word is near you. So God is, is speaking. It is in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. So, so Paul is saying, saying, look what God has done. He's, he's gracious in Christ. His promise, he is faithful to his promise. But we have a message of faith. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all. He richly blesses. Do you hear that? He's a blessing God. All who call on him. Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Will we call on the name of the Lord? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Brothers and sisters, what we see in Abraham is we see the first worshiper, the first disciple, and the first missionary. He went. He was sent by God. And here's how we know it wasn't just about him. Because what does the blessing say? He says, not only will I make you a great nation, not only will I make your name, not only will I bless those who bless you and curse those who, but look at all people on earth will be a blessing through you. You see, what God is teaching us is that he blesses us not just for ourselves, but so it's, it's for this purpose of being a blessing to others. I love what John Piper says in his little book, Let the Nations Be Glad, I think it's his greatest book. He says, mission exists because worship does not. Mission exists because worship does not. Brothers and sisters, we see in Abram a person who responded to the grace of God, heard the promise of God, and he became a worshiper. And he was sent as a worshiper into the world to bring blessing to this world. And brothers and sisters, I believe that's what God is calling us to be. That this blessing is for us, but not just for us, but for the world around us. I want to end with a quick story as the, as the worship team comes up, because I think the, the application of this, I mean, it can go so many directions. But all I can share is my own, my own story of encountering the grace of God, hearing the promise of God. And... Uh, showed up many times in my life but uh, when I was a college student in uh, Chicago um, God was revealing some things to me he was showing me the depravity of my own selfishness my own sin um, but what I was encountering as God was revealing these things about myself was God wasn't condemning me he was giving me grace and Unless you've experienced the full measure of God's grace, it's hard to put into words, and I, have, I struggle to put into words, but all I know is that I was completely undone, and I knew that God was good beyond a reasonable doubt, and that he loved me, and he wanted to bless me, and he wanted to do amazing, amazing work in my life, and so I was learning to trust and obey him to respond in faith in this time. But one day I was out, and I had a job, uh, and uh, I was a window washing landscaper, and I was out in the morning, and uh, I had a difficult boss, a difficult person who was over me. Any of you guys ever had difficult people in your lives? I had a difficult person. And I was complaining to God. I was telling him, you know, if this person would only change, my life would be better. If, you know. And so I was complaining to God. And uh, it's hard to explain the voice of God, but um, there's a few times in my life where I feel like God really has spoken to me. But that was one of them. And God basically just revealed to me, said, Ben, you're wrong. <laughs> you're in the wrong. What God revealed to me in that moment was this person that I was struggling with, he revealed to me and he showed me that this was a person that he loved and that he wanted to bless through me. And it, I can tell you that did not come from me because <laughs> my heart was bent another direction. And so the question is, how do we know the voice of God how do we 
how do we know that Abraham heard from God? How do we know when we hear from God? It, it has to match with the word of God. And God was revealing to me in that time, in that season, as I was studying books like the Gospel of John, where God said, this is my command that, that, that you love others. This is my command that you love others. And all of a sudden, it, it connected in my heart through the power of the Holy Spirit is that God had called me to love this man, to bless this man. And God changed something in me. And you know what? It wasn't just this man. In that moment, something glorious happened, a, a beautiful transcendence beyond myself. And I began to see people differently. I began to see people as people that God loved, that he called me to serve and to share and to bless. Now, I can tell you that that was a work of grace. That was a work of God. But God gave me a promise that day that if I would bless this man, if I would love him, that God was going to work through that for his glory. And God changed something in my heart. He did surgery in my heart, and he changed the direction of my life. And I can tell you today, I am a, a different kind of person. I'm a different father. I'm a different husband. I'm a different pastor because of the grace of God. Now, am I perfect? No. <laughs> and if you keep reading the story of Abraham, what are you going to see? He messes up a lot. <laughs> and I can tell you I failed many times. But here's what God did. He made me into a worshiper because I left that day praising his name. And I want to spend the rest of my life praising his name with everything I have. And brothers and sisters, I believe that's what God has called us to do, is to be the kind of people who praise his name so that we can love our spouses, we can love our kids, we can love our neighbors. Think what God will do as we fall in the way of Abraham, as we become people who bring blessing in Jesus Christ. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, this is the day that you have made. We rejoice in it. Lord, I believe that you are a speaking God who's speaking to the hearts of your people this morning. But not just this morning, throughout this week. God, you are faithful. You are gracious. And God, I know that this purpose, this redemptive plan that you reveal in Jesus Christ, <laughs> that you're inviting us to be part of it, so that we too can be sent ones, <laughs> that we can go and bring blessing. <laughs> that we can bring life into this broken world, that we can bring the truth that, God, you are a God of promise and that you will not fail, that you will make us great, that you will bless us, that, God, you will do what you have promised, that you will provide a place for us, a new land, a new Eden, an eternal home, that we don't have to despair in this world, that we have hope. So God, give hope to your people. Help us to be people of faith and respond to you. Your. Cr- 